very honored to be here today. I know that we are an interdisciplinary group here, so if I'm saying anything that is not clear, that you disagree with, um, or that uh, you uh, would like to say something about while I speak, please just um, interrupt me. I'm, I'm not going to um, just give an overview of the book on personalized medicine that I wrote. Um, the book, I realized, the book's title was announced in the program as, or was mentioned in the program as um, empowered patients in the 21st century. There's a big question mark, so you can see the large red question mark here. Um, it's very large because I had to fight for the question mark with the publisher. They thought it wouldn't sell so well if there was a question mark. It sounds too social science-y. You know, you have to always uh, question everything, but I think it's very important. Um, and uh, Simon kindly mentioned already the uh, European uh, Science Foundation's forward look on personalized medicine, which I didn't share alone, by the way. I shared it with um, Arno Paluti and Stephen Holgate. Um, but there we really had fights over, this was uh, quite a while ago, almost 10 years ago now, but, uh, but about um, between people who thought that personalized medicine was a panacea, um, on the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, the people who thought it was really a very big danger. And as you know, since then, um, personalized medicine has had a very <coughs> mixed press. And a lot hinges on how we understand and define it. And I think uh, the definitions that Simon has, um, has proposed are actually very good, but I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, not because I think I should tell everyone else how to understand personalized medicine, but just empirically to see how the label um, has, has shifted a little bit, how it has been replaced more recently with per precision medicine for, for, for various reasons, and how, as many people remind us, personalized medicine, uh, medicine has of course always been personalized, and especially the clinicians in this room will know this, um, and, and many have said, um, in the early days of personalized medicine being pushed as a concept, it was um, this was almost an insult to everyone who had tried to tailor medicine to the needs of individual patients and characteristics to individual patients. Okay, but um, I'll just uh, tell you very briefly what the structure is going to be. I will first talk about this label, this notion, the meaning of personalized precision medicine. I will try to get us or get out of this um, a very unproductive, I think, dichotomy between those who are personalized medicine uh, supporters and those who are critics. I think what we need to do is we need to define what personalized medicine means. And here the criticism is very, very important. I think we need to reappropriate the notion of personalized medicine. Um, I will therefore highlight some new connections that personalized medicine makes and allows us to see and foreground. And I think that's a very good thing. I will also talk about a few divisions that um, if we don't define the meaning of personalized medicine in a good way, I will say what I mean by good, um, then these new divisions are at risk of creating harms. And again, um, I'm grateful uh, to Simon for having demonstrated exactly what I mean and what I will talk about. Then I will uh, talk about a few challenges that I think we should be addressing regardless of what discipline we are from and what field of practice we're from. And then I'm not going to suffice with uh, uh, m mapping the challenges, but I will um, draw a little bit about our own work to say how, how I think we can address them, not claiming that we have the ultimate solutions, but hopefully um, making some baby steps towards uh, finding solutions. So, uh, yeah, this wonderful book, which I'm sure most, most people in this room know, and if you don't know it, I highly recommend it. Uh, John Berger and John Moore, A Fortunate Man, The Story of a Country Doctor. This is a book about personalized medicine. Um, it doesn't use the term at all, but if for everyone who reads the book, this is really a book about somebody who knows his patients, uh, who knows their individual circumstances, who um, diagnoses, treats, and monitors, to use these contemporary words, to tailor healthcare close, closer to individual characteristics. So this is exactly what it is about. And this is why I think those of us who remind us that we are 
and that medicine has always been personalized, at, at saying something very important. But as I mentioned, the concept of personalized medicine wasn't really used um, before, really in the aftermath of the Human Genome Project, um, where um, matching, um, matching drug treatments to genetic markers of groups of patients was the lowest hanging fruit. Um, a lot of the criticism of personalized medicine as a concept uh, stems exactly from that. First of all, personalized medicine in, in some domains was just a replacement for race-based medicine, where race was used as a proxy for higher frequency of alleles that were uh, seen as important for, um, for drug metabolism. So it had that connotation early on. So personalized medicine is just a euphemism for race-based medicine. There were books written about that. Another point of criticism was that it wasn't about people, it was about groups. And the metaphor that was used in those days was um, the metaphor of the tailor-made suit and the, the mass-produced t-shirt in several sizes or colors. Um, so people said, and Adam Hedgeco makes this argument as well, personalized medicine is really about t-shirts in different sizes and not about custom-made anything. And Partly in response to these points of criticism, um, the notion of precision medicine uh, was rolled out, not only because of that, also because, um, because I think there was, there was the idea to really leave the legacy of personalized medicine behind to some extent. Um, in 2011, the Institute of Medicine in the US National Academy of Sciences um, published a report with the title Toward Precision Medicine. This was the first big use, widespread use of the, or a use of the term that um, um, created a widespread use of this notion of precision medicine. I will say more about that in a minute. In Europe, and when I say Europe, I mean at the EU um, funding uh, level and also within our forward look, also now in the European Commission, um, there's still an emphasis on using the word personalized medicine because we don't want to be hyperbolic like the Americans, some people say. Others say, well, it's really precision medicine is not precise. And, and the use of the notion of personalized medicine reminds us that it should be about the person, as Helen um, also mentioned. So I'm not, I will use this acronym PM now for both. I mean personalized medicine in, in the newer iteration that some call precision medicine, and it includes a couple of things and makes a couple of promises that I will now spend the next few minutes to outline. Just, this is just a, a short interjection to show you that lots of countries, it's not only the US Precision Medicine Initiative, which is now called All of Us, but all around the world, and these are just precision medicine um, 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 initiatives that, in, that focus on uh, or include very prominently type 2 diabetes. So precision medicine is, is really um, taken up as a concept and leading to programs and initiatives all over the world. Um, very famous also the Chinese one with uh, a 9 billion uh, American dollars in funding. So much bigger than the, the actual American original one, to use that label. So what are the key components of precision medicine, of, of personalized medicine in the precision medicine iteration. This is the uh, seminal slide. Um, while we were doing, in, in, in Europe, we, while we were doing the European Science Foundation Forward Look, our colleagues um, in the US did this. Um, they, as I mentioned, promoted this notion of precision medicine and they used a layover map to explain what they meant. Interestingly, they call it a Google map which already outlined some of the problem, I think. Google didn't invent layover maps, but anyhow. Um, so the idea is you have, a, like Google Maps, and you have this integration of different levels of data, the more stable, the more dynamic data sets, and the, the map that, that results from this is something that should lend itself to navigation, not only metaphorically, also literally. I will tell you in a moment why. So this temporal dimension, the navigation, the being able to predict what will happen in the future is a key component of precision medicine uh, in its vision. Um, another key, key component uh, is that we really 
you know, go beyond genomics. Genomics is an important, uh, genetics and genomics retains a very important role, um, but it's no longer a soloist. It's uh, only maybe the first violin in the orchestra, it, not even that sometimes. Um, it's really about, and this is a slide from 2014, <laughs> a group of bioinformatics colleagues, they say we need to bring all of this information together to create um, medicine that is truly, or healthcare in this case, that is truly personalized. So health records, police records, ancestry records, um, lab tests, credit card purchases, um, you know, location data, <laughs> um, as uh, Simon outlined. And um, so all of those things, social media postings, all of this should be brought together. So it's not only, a, it's, it's a multi-omics approach, multi-layered, multi-omics. So the key promises that, that personalized medicine in its iteration of precision medicine makes is that it's systemic, it's multi-omic, um, it closes, it, it, it promises to close the actionability gap between um, um, things that we know at the, at the population level and breaking that down to the individual patient, which is why I included this slide by uh, this, this screenshot of uh, Nick Shork's article, Imprecise Medicine. He says, we know that something works for eight patients out of 10, but we don't know whether it works for this specific patients. So, so, so this is the, the, the gap that precision medicine um, um, promises to close. And this is a dimension that, as I was saying, is not really discussed enough, namely that it, it wants to shift from symptomatic and episodic medicine to continuous and pre-symptomatic medicine. So it's, this is what I meant by navigation. That's in the vision of precision medicine that we have this map that enables us to predict, predict quote unquote, in, in a probabilistic manner, um, what is going to happen in the future. So we, we are collecting in this vision a longitudinal data of a lot of individual patients of, of many different biophysical and behavioral and social aspects. And we do this for many patients. And then first of all, we can create and longitudinal um, maps for individual patients, different layers of data um, that enables us to determine a kind of physiological normal functioning for individual patients. And everyone in this, can, in this sense can become their own control. So deviations from physiological functioning can be detected with artificial intelligence and can be highlighted and can indicate that there's a problem or not. But this should be automated, and it's all um, geared towards making, uh, predicting what will happen in the future. So um, if we accept that those three promises are made, um, I will now say a few good things about what this shift means. Good things, is, it includes, of course, a value, a judgment on my part. Um, I believe with Hilary Putman, Putnam that values and facts um, are two sides of the same coin, or they are, they are at least intertwined, but nevertheless, um, you might disagree that this is a good thing, and um, I'm, I'm curious to hear that if you do. So I, I will just pick three positive developments, which is bridging organ and disease-specific expertise, connecting individual and populations, and integrating biophysical and social and personal, personal factors. And I will just give one example for each. So Leroy Hood, very well known also around his, uh, not only around his uh, Institute for Systems Biology, but also uh, um, his uh, P4 medicine um, notion, namely personalized, uh, predictive, participatory, and, um, and so what, is, what did I not mention now? Personalized? Preventive. Pardon? Preventive. Preventive, exactly. Thank you. Um, that is, of course, a dimension that, in, that bridges uh, organ-specific and, and uh, disease-specific expertise. And, of course, personalized medicine is not causing that. It's not single-handedly bridging this, but it, it, it takes place within a landscape that, that really um, makes a normative statement, a programmatic statement, that we need to bring all of these together. Um, Another very short example is uh, 
for, for this bridging of uh, organ and disease specific expertise um, are developments within immunology, developments in, in oncology um, with the uh, umbrella and basket trials and especially also with the so-called site agnostic uh, oncology um, which so, so we have two drugs at the moment um, um, or recently approved by the FDA that are no longer um, f approved for site-specific cancers, organ-specific cancers, but um, for a particular uh, molecular characterization. So we're moving towards stronger molecular characterization of problems uh, that need to be th that will be treated according to that, um, rather than uh, sort of symptom-based uh, disease uh, um, um, taxonomies. Um, that actually the NAS report in 2011 mentioned explicitly that they want to overcome. So the, the American Precision Medicine Initiative says specifically we want to get away from symptom-based disease taxonomies. We want to get towards uh, data-rich characterizations, not only molecular data, but prominently molecular and other data-rich characterizations of individuals at all stages of health and disease. That is, that is inherent in this precision medicine idea. So connecting individuals and populations. Uh, one example uh, call from colleagues uh, in Germany, um, uh, Turner, Kautzke, and Klimek, they uh, used data from all, um, all patients in Austria, um, took, looked at uh, those who uh, looked at um, diabetes uh, two patients, and um, did, as, as you can see here on the slide, they did a hypothesis-free uh, uh, analysis. Um, th they call this a data-driven approach um, to find that um, lipid-reducing uh, drugs uh, reduced uh, cancer risk in diabetes patients. So this, why did I pick this? Because it, 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 it outlines something that Simon mentioned that I want to highlight that really the idea of collecting a lot of data underpins all of this, but also because um, some colleagues, in some colleagues seem to, some colleagues keep emphasizing that personalized medicine inevitably includes this radical individualization that the, the me medicine type of, of, of healthcare um, that isolates and insulates the individual. And I don't think this is entirely fair. Personalized medicine and precision medicine constantly oscillates between the individual and the population level. Const so one doesn't mean anything without the other. The individual biomarkers, the individual characterizations do not have any meaning without comparisons to, 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 the, to a population. And of course, everyone working in genetics and genomics knows that. But this is something that in the, more, in the wider debate sometimes gets lost. So personalized medicine is this bad dark force that individualizes everything and cuts people up, or populations up. Third, integrating biophysical and social and personal factors. So again, this is not something that personalized medicine does alone, but um, personalized medicine takes place in an era where we always talk about value-based healthcare, even if we don't talk about it. So there are more and more metrics that, that, that assess value at the, you know, directly from patients, patient-reported outcomes, patient-reported experience measures, and so on, reimbursement and incentives and pricing module, models for value-based healthcare, um, businesses, drug companies, they're now thinking about how they can change their work so that it, um, it, it, it caters to the new metrics and the new assessment criteria, the new pricing models. This is one aspect of affordable care that actually Trump hasn't really rolled back. We don't talk about it much, but account, uh, affordable care was about in, uh, the, 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 the widening of insurance, but it was also about moving from volume to value. Value remains totally underdefined, underdetermined. Nobody really says what value is. There are lots of different ways of measuring it, and they all suck. But, um, <laughs> but anyhow, the idea that, that, that we're moving towards, we are pri pricing and, re and reimbursing according to value is something that is still there. And here, actually, precision medicine is a tool 
precision medicine, if we say that we tailor healthcare to the, to the individual characteristics of patients, then it means what is valuable for patients at the personal level. How do we do that? We haven't worked that out, but precision medicine is, is and I think some companies are seeing that now, that precision medicine is, can be a tool to deliver value-based healthcare. If, 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 we, if we do that in the right way. And of course, it's a key moment now for us to determine what value is and not only leave it to, um, to people who are, are legitimately but primarily in, interested in, in financial profits. So what was all of this about? I now talked about the good things about PM, personalized precision medicine. What is all of this about? It's all about um, data. Uh, each of these examples, and I didn't pick them initially because of that, but each of these examples are heavily dependent on the collection of data. And this is, by the way, what my book is about, that I really talk about the ways in which so-called empowered patients need to do a lot of patient work, to use a Straussian term, to, to, um, to, to, to participate in making data available. And, um, uh, Henrik Vogt et al, and um, this is of course also uh, a colleague who has benefited greatly from um, Trisha's support and insight. Um, he's a colleague in uh, Norway, and they, these colleagues argued that what we have now is, a, is an, we've entered an era of technoscientific holism with personalized medicine and precision medicine, where on the one hand, we are being more holistic because of all these new connections that I just outlined, at the same time, we have a very narrow notion now of what evidence is according to which we stratify and according to which we personalize. This is the main difference to the country doctor um, in the 20th century. So the country doctor was doing personalized medicine, we're doing it now, but the data, the information that we use for this purpose and the central storage, blah, 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 now we live in a digital world. Um, that is the key difference. So it's a wonderful way of putting this. Each person's whole life process is defined in biomedical, techno-scientific terms as quantifiable and controllable and underlaying a regime of medical control that is holistic in that it is all encompassing. Um, so this is, this is what, what precision medicine really does. Uh, some of the new divisions, um, Again, these are, this is not a, com, a sort of comprehensive overview, it's just picking out a few particularly interesting and, and, and maybe worrying uh, um, developments. In clinical trials, we all know that we had lots of missing populations, non, everyone who was not an adult white male, more or less, um, was missing and underrepresented. Um, but, and a lot of people say that, yeah, in precision medicine, we're data driven. We don't have these biases anymore. But of course, we do. Um, if you have a comprehensive uh, data monitoring of a particularly uh, privileged patient population somewhere in the US, you have a very, very biased group. And that becomes the reference population according to which we compare individual information. So we are getting in, into all of those filter bubbles the data-rich filter bubbles of whatever biased group we have. And here, so this is a moral dilemma for me, for example, here those countries that have national data sets, Denmark to some extent, the UK, um, and who, who want to maintain people in the database because we want to represent everyone and we want to make policy decisions on the basis of everyone's population and not only those insured with BUPA or Kaiser Permanente. So sometimes there's a kind of push to go to opt out solutions because we want to retain everyone. And we know that when we have opt in, the privileged will opt in. At the same time, so this is of course also a dilemma around care data. At the same time, it raises ethical issues. I'm not going to talk about this, but so there's something to be said to ha not to have this selective data bubbles that we then make decisions upon. And a lot of the online tools have the same problem. They represent everyone in a population that is on Facebook or that is wherever. So what, an important thing to keep in mind is that digital, me so, so personalized medicine takes place in the context of digital 
a digital world. And I think we mustn't think about digitization in, in, in the sense of we now do things uh, in the digital world that we used to do on paper, in the analog world. This is not what it is. We now, of course, we are transposing some things that we always did in the diagnosing patients, moving around and eating into a, a sort of a data capture, into datafication. That's one thing. But there are also really new practices created at the individual level and at the institutional level through digitization and datafication. That's what I'm uh, going to spend the next minutes to point out before I then come to my uh, challenges and conclusions. So datafication is not the same as digitization, although it overlaps. Um, it means that more and more aspects of our bodies and lives that used to be private are no longer private because they're captured. What Simon illustrated was a very good example. You know, you have been to, I don't know, Heathrow Airport and uh, 350 people might have seen you but they, unlike your phone, don't know where you have been on any other day of the year. So this is, Peter Surden calls this the, um, the, 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 the loss of, um, um, of uh, privacy in the sense that, um, th that because more and more data being captured, um, privacy retreats. There's no nefarious intention by anyone. But the privacy is just pushed back. So fewer and fewer aspects of us are private. Um, all data nowadays are health data. They're health relevant. We can make health relevant inferences from the most innocuous non-health related data. Um, if you just use a hypothesis for your approach, if you look at characteristics that people have who have uh, a higher probability to suffer from a chronic disease, it might include characteristics that have nothing to do with health. So we need to really treat all, health, all, all data potentially as health data. Um, and, this, and, and this datafication doesn't only move old practices to the digital domain, but it also creates new ones. One example that I quote in my book, um, this was in the beginning of um, Nike Fuel. Um, fuel band. So this was a, a young student in Copenhagen who said this will not be news to you, but this is an example of how um, digitization creates new practices and also digital health tools create new practices. He says, at the ev end of the day, if I ha haven't gotten enough points, I might just take a walk. Um, you have a little satisfactory feeling just because you've re reached your goal. So here, the datafication is performative. It makes people do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. Um, another, and this is a kind of technical quote, which is why I'm going to say what it says. Um, Shoshana Zuboff is now in the news. She wrote this new book on surveillance capitalism, but her old book, 1988, is really very interesting as well. It's about automation. There was a lot of automation anxiety in the, in the 1980s, as there was in the 1950s. Now we are being told by The Economist and other newspapers that now humanity is going this, through this revolutionary change. Well, it's a deja vu. But what Zuboff shows us is that automation and information is not the same thing. So when we automate, we're moving something that humans did to the machine. But in the, the process of information means that there is an information surplus that is created by doing that. So a car tire company that used to sell car tires now has sensors on the tires that give information on the temperature on the road, um, the speed, and so on. And these data become an asset for the company to sell back to trucking companies, for example, to say, if you reduce the speed of your drivers, da, 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 you can curb your fuel consumption, and it will be cheaper for you. Amazon used to be a bookseller. Um, but the information that they got from what you read, when you buy it, what else you buy, da, 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 became an asset in itself. So this is another instance of the performative nature of digitization and datafication that in the health domain has led to the situation that, for example, we now have the big healthcare companies, the, the big healthcare players are not only big pharma, it's the tech companies. Amazon is the new, positions itself as a healthcare company, and why wouldn't they? When they already know what you read, what you eat, and so on, 
why would they not want the health data as well? So ex we all talk about the ethics of AI, but the ethics of AI hinges on the availability of large data sets. And here, the large corporations are and not pharmaceutical companies, but the tech corporations are taking the lead. Governments are laughable in this regard. This is not Big Brother anymore. Governments, it's, it's now, as, as Jerry Kang calls it, Big Brother and Company Man. So um, another not so nice <laughs> thing, if I can call it this way, um, in, uh, about personalized medicine is that, you know, Stephen Gould, when he, re when he wrote his very important reply to uh, the bell curve, um, he said, we make this mistake in, in, in biology, in human biology, that we reify abstract co concepts into entities, then we rank them, as happened with race. And in order to do this, we need to quantify first, because if you don't quantify, you can't compare, you can't rank. So big data says, big data practices, digital health says, data-driven biology. We don't do this anymore. We segment, we individualize, and we predict on the basis of neutral evidence, which to some extent is true. But what they really do is they create a lot of data that are out there. This is the interpretation gap that then lead to the, uh, lead to the creation of commercial services to provide the interpretation and to provide exactly what Stephen Gould was talking about the reification of abstract concepts into entities, the ranking, and the quantification. So when, when 23 and Me said, I'm not giving you healthcare uh, information anymore, you can still download your SNPs. Guess what happened? There were, there were some services, commercial and, and non-commercial, that offered the interpretation service. So the, 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 the generation of large data sets creates a demand of interpretation that still runs the same risks that Stephen Gold talked about in 18th, 19th, and early 20th century um, human biology and medicine. Um, so examples for that, disease interception is a new concept pushed by pharma. Um, disease interception is the idea that everyone already, every one of us already has diseases inside us and we need to detect them earlier on. You know, with this ubiquitous monitoring, this is exactly what you get. Uh, this is why we need to monitor. Of course, they want people to take drugs earlier on. But I think the notion of disease interception is quite interesting. Because where does this notion come from? It comes from counterterrorism, defense. The bomb is already launched. You can intercept it. So this is an idea where health I don't think it's a trivial observation. I think it's quite profound. Health no longer exists. This is really, um, we no longer have patients in waiting, as Timmermans called it. And everyone is now a patient in, in a world of disease interception. And disease interception, and here's where the, 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 the system becomes self-referential. Self With disease interception, we create the need to monitor even more, because you need to be able to intercept. And of course, the tools there are here. There's also this notion of continuous health, with, uh, which uh, mirrors that. And of course, all you know, all know the commercials around Apple Watch. Um, they could predict things in your future before they actually, before you know, and before your doctor knows that they will happen. And I think in this context, it is really necessary to take a closer look on um, at, at the political economy within which this happens. And we have, uh, we have uh, used the, the term I Leviathan to talk about a new kind of Leviathan that is emerging here where people submit their freedoms in order to get something back. It's like with the Hobbesian Leviathan where people submitted their natural freedoms to get their civic freedom and the protection of their bodies lives and property. And here we submit freedoms and we get something else. Why is it the Leviathan? Because people don't have a realistic op opt out. You know, nowadays we know we need, um, we need sometimes even to make use of these uh, commercial data services in order to access public services. 
um, to, 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 to be able to participate in parent-teacher conversations, you need WhatsApp. Um, in order to register for some things, you need Facebook. So thank you to the organizers that it wasn't necessary for this event. So there are more and more um, uh, um, situations where there's no realistic opt-out and to say, well, people don't need to use WhatsApp, they don't need to be on Facebook, is not quite um, a good, uh, a good uh, argument. And so I don't, I don't think the problem is restricted to GAFA, but there's this idea or there's this observation that the more personalization precision becomes data driven, the large data companies take on a more important role. So um, I'm coming slowly to the end. What are the key challenges to be addressed and how can we address them? Um, one, one important thing is that we definitely need better data governance. And I don't mean better, better privacy protection or better data protection. I will say a little bit more about what I mean. I will just outline it. So, so far, the, the, the common idea has been to say, uh, okay, we have these large data companies in the health domain and elsewhere. In order to counterbalance that, we need to give individuals more control. This has been the thrust of the EU General Data Protection Regulation, um, also the thrust of many very good solutions that have been developed. But an, an, an unintended consequence of this, and here I really mentioned things that I think are genuinely important, so I'm not uh, meaning to diss the, them at all. One effect of this has been that the relationship between the data user, the, the patient, and the data, uh, sorry, the patient and the data user is individualized. And people, ha people have argued increasingly now that what we need is more collective agency control and oversight as well. Let's not individualize these problems. Um, so there are approaches such as the data as labor approach, solidarity-based health uh, data governance, which is our own work, and commons approaches um, that uh, that, that try to say, okay, individual control is very important, individual control of patients over our health data and other data is important, but we need more. Um, so what does it mean to have this collective uh, emphasis on collective agency and control? Um, it means that the, the, the this discussion about data governance in the health domain and beyond moves away from focusing only on ownership and consent. I give you two examples for why ownership and consent is not enough and probably not, doesn't even begin to capture the problem. So Amgen, you know, they, um, many of you will know that Amgen in 2017 uh, started to give uh, discounts uh, to patients, to poor patients, to drugs if they allowed the company to use their healthcare data and their personal data. Um, here, this is a very sad story about a woman who was too poor to get to buy a car, too poor to get a loan, but she could still get a car. She had kids, she needed a car. She could still get a car if she agreed to have a, a device installed on the engine that would stop the car when she was late with her mortgage payments. And indeed, this is why she made headlines. Sadly, it did, the car did stop when she was actually rushing her daughter to the hospital. So, I mean, these people, legally signed over ownership to their data to someone else. They consented. With consent, we, don't, we cannot solve these problems. These are problems about data justice, about justice more broadly. So a collective focus on data governance focuses on, on other issues than merely ownership and consent. It focuses on responsibility and governance. Um, so what does it mean? We are not accepting that the key problem is ownership and consent. We are not accepting, sorry, Simon, the data is the new oil, because was, what does the new oil narrative do? It tells us, oh, it's out there in nature, and somebody needs to do the hard work to get the data out of the ground, uh, the oil out of the ground, refine it, make it suitable for consumption. And of course, the oil company then should be paid. They own the oil. But data is not in there, and Google is taking them out taking it out. Um, data is something that y you create, I create as, by being a patient, by being a citizen, by de being a, a user of various online and offline services. Um, 
infrastructures are created by public money. So why would some people own the data like oil? So I think, I feel very strongly we should not buy into this data as oil narrative at all. Data is something else. Keen Birch has done very interesting work where he really shows how um, data are currently assetized. They're turned into an asset by some people who just say that they are. There's not even a, a discussion. How should we treat health data and other data? They're just seen as an asset. So um, we must foreground questions of value and benefit. We know how to measure value. We don't know what it is. This is Matsukato's argument, but it's truer than ever also in healthcare. Um, when we talk about value-based healthcare, um, we always need to ask what and whose data are missing. Um, so when we use, when we work with a data set, we need to think of who's not represented, um, who's, who's, yeah, who is not visible. Um, we need to scrutinize practices and categories of exclusion um, in personalization and personalized medicine, precision medicine, more than ever, because we have so many. We have so many data now, so much information that allows us to exclude people based on evidence. You know, you don't qualify for something because your prognosis is worse than somebody else's. And sometimes I think we just need to say we do not stratify except for health benefits, but maybe not for economic benefits. Um, and we need to address data governance uh, as part of a larger political economy. Data governance in medicine and healthcare cannot be just fixing consent. So, uh, and then at the very end, I'm going to just say something about what I mean by, practically speaking, about collective decisions, collective responsibility and ownership of what we do with the data that we collect. Um, the so-called, uh, the so-called. Um, a Nobel Prize in economics, and as you know, economics doesn't really have a Nobel Prize, but they have a, a pretend one. Um, it went to Richard Thaler um, in 2017, who was who became famous with, with among other things, um, and famous in the public with the idea of nudging. So this nudging is a, is is a program, and it says something about how we should use data. Nudging requires data. And nudging, it's not a coincidence that nudging is so common now in healthcare. It's a particular way of using data in healthcare. A particular way, and you can see an example here. Um, this will be uh, very close to home for many of you. Um, I think we would all agree that people who uh, don't need to go to, uh, to an A&E shouldn't go to an A&E because it, it's a waste of resources. It's um, agonizing for everyone involved. So one, one um, idea of how nudging could be used on a data-driven basis would be to collect information from people who came to A&E, who didn't meet the criteria for A&E, and these people would be sent a message, dear patients, our records show that you have attended A&E, blah, 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 you better not, because it's a waste of resources, and I'm not going to read out what, hap what can happen. Some of you saw this on, on Twitter, but this is, again, this is not just a, a, a trivial incident, it's an example of how this particular way of using data can, it tells people that they are a number, it tells people that the data are used against them, and it can really um, decrease trust into a system. So how else can we use data in healthcare? Because we're clearly, I mean, I'm not advocating to stop precision medicine, to stop data-driven medicine. But we can also, this is another um, Nobel Prize, I mean, Nobel, this is the, the, the um, Swedish uh, Reichsbank uh, um, Prize in, um, in memory of Alfred Nobel. Ellen Ostrom also got it in 2009. And she has an alternative view of how we can use data. Namely, we can use data in healthcare to create better collective responses, to improve our institutions, to not stratify according to costs at the individual level, but we, we keep stratifying for health benefits, obviously. We can do much more than we could on the basis of data, but sometimes when we can use data at the individual level, maybe we shouldn't, and maybe we should create good institutions instead. So she said, 
this is a quote from her speech that she gave uh, when she was given the, the prize. Designing institutions to force or nudge entirely self-interested individuals to achieve better outcomes has been the major goal posited by policy analysts for governments. But extensive empirical research that she has carried out leads her to believe that a core goal of public policy should be to facilitate the development of institutions that bring out the best in humans. So this is the good old social determinants. We can use data also to improve social determinants. And here I'm really this is coming to the end. This is now my last slide. I think better data governance as a political endeavor is necessary if we want to utilize and develop precision medicine in a valuable way. And of course, we have to have a discussion of, about what value is. I would love to hear what, what you think we, we should say that value is. And we need, here I'm drawing upon Vogt et al. again, we need not a tech, techno-scientific only, but also a humanistic understanding of holism um, in, good timing, in personalized medicine. So we need an emphasis on human contact, not machine-like um, efficiency. Interestingly, the Topol review goes much further in this direction than I feared it would. It's actually quite high touch, not only high tech. Um, it's not only about big data, but also about big interpretation. And, in, and importantly, instead of targeting behavior at the individual level, which also implies choice, you know, people have chosen to behave in an unhealthy way. Instead of doing that, let's create institutions that bring out the best in people. And in many cases, this will be um, social determinants and, and um, you know, human uh, touch in healthcare as well. And without that, I think the data-driven precision medicine is not going to work or it's going to create big harms. And this is what I mean when I say, let's not just say personalized medicine, precision medicine are dangerous or bad, and, but let's, let's reappropriate what the term should mean. And with this, um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, this is the book, if you're interested. Thank you very much.